it constantly amazes me how many people are involved in creating her because everyone who is involved seems to have the same vision for her. And for so many people to have one mind about a character, it, it blows my mind. I mean, very rarely do I get a piece of direction or script that doesn't ring true to how I feel about Alex and vice versa. And strangely enough, as soon as I try something out and something doesn't ring true, I'm usually not the first person to say it, even though I might be feeling it, somebody else will say it. And it's just, I guess, a testament to how, how in tune everybody is about what kind of person Alex is and what she would do, what she wouldn't do, and, you know, what kind of girl she is. The launch of Magnuson's rocket ties directly into the rocket Gordon launched at Black Mesa. Here, the portal satellite array that opened a gate to Zen in Half-Life 1 has been repurposed to shut the Combine out. This is just another example of the way we constantly try to weave the old threads of the Half-Life story into the new episodes. Power to main thrusters. Steady on. T minus 10, 9, we are launching. 8, 7, 6, 5, Steady. Steady. 4, 3, 2, Episode 2's backgrounds or vistas are created in a manner that fuses traditional 2D animation techniques, using linear cards moving against each other to imply parallax, and a modern digital take which involves placing these cards in a 3D environment and manipulating their size and distance from camera depending on the scale needed. A series of cards can sit in front of a 3D skybox, and with the addition of atmosphere or fog, a realistic result can be achieved. Developing the Half-Life episodes allows us to steadily flesh out the details in an ongoing cosmic struggle. Most of this conflict remains far in the background, but little by little we are able to bring new elements up front. One of our goals for Episode 2 was to fully develop the grub-like advisors first glimpsed in Half-Life 2. In Episode 1, they make several brief appearances but have no direct effect on the events in the game. In Episode 2, we deliberated on how soon to show them becoming active and decided to pull back the veil in stages. Therefore, we first see them being hauled around by Combine troops, completely passive. Next, we see one waking up from incubation, still somewhat groggy, and beginning to discover its power. But by the end of the episode, the advisors come fully into their own, front and center, as characters with a huge impact on the story. To create the Eli death sequence, we talked it through in great detail wrote up an outline with all the events we discussed, and then produced an animatic. We used rough sketches painted over screenshots and a variety of crude special effects and sounds to create a quick pre-visualization of how the scene would play out. Not only did this help us to converge on a shared vision for the scene, but by working rough, we were able to quickly iterate until we had a design worth implementing in the game. The decision to kill Eli was not made lightly, and once we'd made it, we had to figure out how to make it meaningful. We had already established Eli's frailty as well as his importance to the Resistance and Alex's devotion to him, so from a narrative point of view, the impact of his death seemed obvious. The hard part would be the execution. The advisor's ability to immobilize the player gave us a way to stage the scene. Then the animations and the sound design made it believable. But none of this would have been enough without inspired performances by Merle Dandridge and Robert Guillaume. This final episode two scene was unbelievable. Before we even started working on it, the team sat me down and they kind of did a little show and tell of the, the rough animation that they had. And I think they were hesitant to show it to me, but just from that rough animation, I was so moved. I mean, just immediately moved to tears. I felt like I'd just been gut punched and I, I immediately felt it. I immediately felt it. I was like, let's go. Let's, let's get on this. So it shouldn't surprise me. <laughs> it shouldn't surprise me by now because I've been working on Alex for so long now. But every time we come to the table to do a new scene or, or uh, lay down some new material, I am always blown away. And this scene was just the epitome of that feeling. Um, I was so pumped to get in there <laughs> and, and start working on it. And they're always upping the, upping the ante and always um, taking it to the next level. But this time, this scene is different. Because this time, Alex loses. And I think this is a... I don't think. It is a major sacrifice. She, you see her carrying around the wounds of her mother that she lost, but 
her dad made her who she is. Her dad taught her, her dad groomed her, and I think, most importantly, he loved her. And um, this script was a gift and a gut punch all in one. Um, I don't know. When you, when, you, when you give me something like that, it really motivates me to kind of try to knock it out of the ballpark. I love, love playing Alex. And I have to say, it's definitely my favorite acting job I've ever had, hands down. Are you sure you have everything you need? I think so. Dr. Kleiner gave us the Borealis coordinates. We'll keep the hailing frequency open on the chopper radio in case Judith tries to reach us again. Good idea. She could well make another attempt. Dad! Gordon! Help! Dad! Alex! Dad! Get away! Oh my god!